Your running watch is lying to you. I'm Devlin from coachparry.com where we help you to become fitter, faster and stronger. Today we're going to talk about some of the inaccuracies in the data of your running watch and why you shouldn't rely too much on it. I'm going to hand over to Lindsay to talk about GPS data. One of the bigger mistakes that I see runners making from amateur all the way to the elite is relying too heavily on a GPS watch, particularly in a race situation. So why do I say that? There is going to be a sampling error. Now what is sampling rate and sampling error? What am I talking about? There is communication happening between your GPS device and satellites up in the sky and that's only happening at an interval so even if you set that interval on your watch to one second that means there's always going to be this tiny delay there are algorithms built in to try and minimize those um, sampling errors and of course when we're running your device is on a moving object your arm is moving and your body is moving so it's never going to be 100 percent accurate but that error is small. It's so small that we can happily use GPS technology for training because the information we're getting and the feedback we're getting from that um, watch is an acceptable error. It's close enough that we are doing what it is we are aiming to do in that session. Unfortunately when it comes to a race and especially if you are on a marginal time, if you're going for a sub three, a sub three and a half, a sub five, sub, sub five fifteen, when you are on the, the borderline of that, that sampling error can be one to two seconds and in your cheaper GPS devices can be as much as three or four seconds per kilometer. Now if you add that up over the course of a marathon, you're going to be over a minute out on your projected time. So how do we allow for that sampling error on a GPS? Well, that's actually pretty simple. If you're running in most races, they have kilometer or mile marker boards. And so you want to manually lap your watch at each mile marker board, because that'll, a kilometer marking board, because that will give you an idea of what your pace was for that particular kilometer. And if you have a, a pacing chart which just gives you a bit of an idea of where you need to be at 5Ks or 5 miles, halfway, so on and so forth, track those times against the marker boards of the race and not on your GPS device. Otherwise, you're going to get to the finish and you're going to be one of those runners that I need to argue with at the end that the course was not long. <laughs> GPS technology is not as accurate as you would like to believe that it is. Thanks, Linz. So, heart rate data. Now, heart rate data is a very valuable tool when it comes to training and monitoring intensities and probably one of the easiest ones and most accessible ways of us monitoring intensity. However, it is how accurate that heart rate reading is that actually counts. A lot of us these days are using wrist-based units. Um, they have a little elliptical sensor, a little flashing light behind the unit. And those are probably the most inaccurate way of measuring heart rate. Reason being is it uses a little elliptical light or a little infrared light that flashes and measures the blood volume through your blood vessels in your wrist. Now, any movement on that wrist unit is going to affect how accurate those readings are. Some of you might have run and find that your heart rate is suddenly through the roof and you're not sure what's going on. And then within 20, 30 meters, it's suddenly rock bottom and you think you've recovered very well. So that is one thing to be absolutely careful of when you are monitoring heart rate and how accurately you want to be or how closely you want to be looking at the data. For a more accurate reading and probably what we refer to as the gold standard in heart rate reading would be to have a chest strap. Now the chest strap works on electrical current or electro current that is right above the heart as well. So it almost simulates what an ECG or an EKG machine would do as well. So much more accurate, not always the most comfortable. The, the newer chest straps we use these days are fabric rather than the old rubber plastic ones. So they have become a little bit more comfortable, but by far if heart rate is something you really want to monitor, those are going to be the most accurate. Otherwise, to be quite frank, there's almost no point in measuring heart rate 
if the, if the readings are not going to be accurate enough for us to look into. So if you're going to use the information that the watch gives you around training status, we need to unpack it a little bit. Devlin has already explained to you where to watch out and what the pitfalls are, the inaccuracies around um, heart rate readings and, and what sort of uh, devices to use and are more accurate. Now, when your watch calculates your training, current training status, productive, unproductive, you need a rest for three days, etc., it is taking into account as part of its calculation heart rate, part of that calculation is uh, our training paces and it's analyzing it over a period of time. So it doesn't only take into account that specific run that you've just done. So one of the key things around using the information that a watch is giving you around your training status and how seriously you should or shouldn't take that information is that there should be at least 40 days of information to track against because a good unit will compare a chronic load which is a load that is over a long period of time versus an acute load and what that acute load being today's session or perhaps the, the, the past week at most, how does that compare to the amount of work that you've been doing over a sustained period of time? Because if, for example, over a long period of time, you have been averaging um, in the region of 50 miles or 80 kilometers a week, then doing a long run of of 20 miles or 32 kilometers should hardly blip on the radar of that watch because it will be within the realms of what you are doing. So it may tell you productive two days of recovery, not necessarily rest, but recovery. However, if over the last 40 days you've been doing 10 miles or 16 kilometers a week and then you suddenly go out and do a really high intensity, high volume workout or that same 20 mile 32k run, suddenly your watch is going to tell you you're overreaching and you need a week to recover. So that just gives you an idea of, of where and how those algorithms should play out. And then the second layer of that is that there is no way that any device with an algorithm is really going to be able to tell you how you feel. So you need to couple that information with how am I feeling so that as you go along this road using the device to tweak and move and shift workouts, you actually have a, a log of how the watch compares to how you're feeling because that will help you make better decisions down the road. When your watch says, hey, you need two days of recovery, but you're like, ah, I feel fine, and you ignore it, and then three days later you start to unravel, if you've kept a good record of that, you'll know next time, okay, my watch is saying I need two days of recovery, so I must take it easy the next two days. I'm not going to do Tuesday's hard workout because last time I did that, I unraveled on Wednesday. The next thing we have to be really careful of when we are using GPS technology is the VO2 max and or race predictor. So again, all of these things are based in on algorithms um, that take some of you as an individual into account but they've taken a lot of um, information from from loads of people and try to work it into a model that brings out an answer at the end so I'm going to just touch on the VO2 max one at first because the watches as a general rule tend to under predict VO2 max but also don't take into account the impact of freshening up. So what you'll often see is that when you're recovering or think you're recovering, doing the right thing, suddenly your VO2 max drops a few pegs. And that obviously doesn't uh, make any sense when we think about it uh, logically. So to use VO2 max, again, just like when we're trying to use the, the algorithms around when we're productive, etc., is that you want to look at it over a long period of time. And so if you're in a, a, a big training block working towards a specific race, what you're looking for from that VO2 max is that it is trending upwards. There may be some little wobbles along the way when it goes down in recovery weeks, etc. But what we want is trending upwards. And then 
when you start to taper, do not become alarmed when that VO2 starts to drop or feel like it's dropping too much and you have to add, add in extra training. The race predictor is actually quite useful, but again, it's very important that you know how to use it. So the race predictor takes into account a combination of your high intensity workouts and your long and easy runs. And it's trying to balance out a score between your aerobic ability and your anaerobic ability or, or your ability to run fast high intensity versus your ability to run slow and long and from a balance of that it spits out your five your ten a half marathon and marathon predicting times but it works it out on a fairly linear scale and that's where we just have to be a little bit careful again as athletes as you train and go about um, doing various events you will learn that you have a predisposition to be slightly better on the short versus the long so in other words if as a general rule your 5k times are predicting faster times than you actually achieve when you go longer that tells you that you are better at the short stuff and so in future when you are making race plans and deciding what pace to go out in a race you need to take into account the fact that you have a fade as you go longer and similarly as in many people their 5k consistently under predicts what they are capable of doing longer and in that scenario you need to downshift um, that and know that your marathon time could well be quite a bit faster than predicted based on your current training status if you want to learn more about how to pace your, yourself and, and plan a race, you can watch the video that's on screen now. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button and don't forget to subscribe so you get the rest of our content.